Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on the Conscious Resistance Network uh, and the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel. So this is part two of our debate um, between um, anarcho-capitalism and uh, direct democracy uh, or the existence of government at all. You know, at all. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, so, um, so you want to... All right, so you want to revisit some of the things to clarify some of the things last time first before you get into new topics? From last time, I, I feel like your position is sort of like um, teetering on the edge a little bit because okay. some of the things that you use to define like democracy, um, you used words like tyranny or of the, of the major, you know, mob rule, uh, rule of the majority. Um, and you, you gave sort of insinuations that there's no, there's no choice. Um, but then when I came back, I guess we were started talking about citizenship and um, basically the fact that at any point you do have a choice whether or not you participate, right? Like if there's two choices, you stay out of the jail or you go into the open door jail cell and throw the shackles on your wrist that have no, no, no lock on them. And, you know, those are the two choices. Like if you pick choice two, you can't exactly say that you're, you're an imprisoned man and you have no choice and that your, your funds are being stolen from you or what have you. Like there is always the choice, you know, being a, a part of the U S is like a subscription service, you know, uh, you get all these benefits, uh, you know, we have uh, dispute resolution, we have um, public defense and all these things. And uh, so, you know, if you choose to be a part of this service, you have to pay a yearly fee that's deducted from your credit card every year. Or at any point, you can, you know, cancel that service and uh, at which point, you know, uh, we won't charge your credit card anymore, basically. Mm -hmm. I, I understand there's like an expatriate tax, but that's a one-time fee and it's within, you know, when you have a certain level of income, blah, 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 but uh, whatever. So my point is you can't use these sort of like these terms that mean that you're being uh, – things are being d done to you against your will when you do have a choice. So, Okay. So, so one, one clarification I would say uh, that comes to mind is um, – so, so when you use the term – I remember we discussed it last time also. When you use the term we and us, right? So you're basically – to me, what that suggests is that we are the government, right? Um, in that uh, you know the people equals government, right? Um, and <laughs> I think that's a erroneous notion for many reasons. Um, one of which is that um, <laughs> to say that we are the government is essentially to say that you know anything the government does has been approved by the people. You know, like not that's not, not necessarily true, right? Okay, hold on, hold on, hold not, on. Not, hold on. not all forms of government. Okay, hold okay, on, go ahead. hold on, let me yeah, just keep finish. going. So, so, so yeah, so. Whatever the government does is approved by the people or has has been done to the people themselves. For example, you know anything that a government does, let's say go to war, let's say rack up debt, let's say spy and assistance, it's all approved by the people, right? Because we are the government. That's that's the idea when you well, say we. We right? all aren't. Well, no. I mean, <laughs> first of all, I mean, look, we all are not the government. And so if we were all the government, if – all of us needed to approve every single law and every single disciplinary action that went through the system, we'd never get anything else done. You know, th there's something called, uh, you know, um, separation of labor, right? So everybody kind of does what they're good at, and that's kind of like how, free markets, uh, how a free market society works. In fact, if there was no separation of labor, if everybody did everything, there wouldn't be a need to trade, right? If all we were doing is just hunting and gathering berries and everybody participated in that hunting and gathering process, then yeah, there's no need for trading because everybody has, does the same thing and everybody gets about the same thing. And so there's no need for government there. So basically, uh, the whole idea of having representatives is saying, hey, look, we don't want everybody in the, in the country to be worried about all these little details, right? We want a, a smaller group of people to sort of make some of those decisions and we only we only help in the process of selecting the people that make those decisions we don't actually make them ourselves so i mean to have for for we to mean that everybody is government that i mean that's that's completely illogical and erroneous i don't i don't claim that that's okay. Com completely okay. okay so i i definitely agree with the division of labor that uh, mm -hmm. entirely makes sense. You know, n mm -hmm. none of us or, or very few of us are entirely self-sufficient um, mm -hmm. to, you know, survive on our own. Like, you know, in the wilderness, we, we require uh, the skills and talents of our, you know, 
of our neighbors uh, and our friends in order to survive, right? I don't know if we require that. I mean, I think it just makes life easier when you do that because people can focus on a, f- a few things and then that makes everyone else's lives easier because they don't have to worry about those things. They can just do other work for people that they don't want to do. So it sort of like it makes everyone's lives uh, go easier when you are doing that. You're cooperating. Yeah, I mean, it's the whole idea. Yeah, it's essential cooperation. And, and mm-hmm. I would actually um, say that that would be the, de- the definition of capitalism, which is basically just um, voluntary exchange between peaceful people. Um, sure. And, and that over time. You know, mm-hmm. as as um, technology improves, as people's skills improve, as in, in new inventions uh-huh. come out, right? So this increases the wealth, increases the standard of living of society as a whole, right? And mm-hmm. and that that actually has nothing whatsoever to do with government. So what I'm what I'm saying is mm-hmm. that government is entirely separate. Not only is entirely separate from the peaceful trading and exchange of people, but in fact is destructive and is in fact like a leech. It's like it's like sure. sucking that, that's the productivity where... off of the industrious. This is where I'm coming from. So okay, and that's completely like the the crux of our disagreement, right? Uh, you think that is unnecessary, whereas I think that it is absolutely 100% completely necessary to have the structure of government in order for a free market society to even work. So that that's kind of where where we differ there. Okay. And I think. Mm-hmm. Okay, no, I think we're going to get to that in some of our examples. Okay. Right? All right. So, well, let me ask you what What do you think would happen if there was no government? Let's say so. So we're, let's define anarchy here. So there is no government. So what What do you think would happen? What What are you afraid of that you think? Um, need, I'm not. I'm not government? afraid. I don't, I don't. I'm not afraid of that eventuality. But I think that it is. Uh, it would these things would for sure happen um i, I mean I, th- I don't think that it's very dif- difficult to i think it's very difficult to dispute that anyway i think the things my concerns are going to come up later in the video when we start discussing things like let's see um dispute resolution uh, i mean i think those are like some of the most hard arguments that you're going to have to face today are are those are like public defense um mm-hmm. but i think i think those are gonna be very difficult but we'll see so um so so, so an- another thing is um so, so you're saying that you know there's people trading right <clears throat> and then <clears throat> we need uh, a, a small group of people in charge of you know the important stuff like defense and you know managing the economy and interest rate you know fixing or whatever uh, so we need these people <clears throat> to manage everyone else. <clears throat> is essentially what you're saying, right? We- I don't think we need them to manage the tiny little um, affairs of everyone's like private lives. But I think there are certain important functions that is hard to carry out without a mutually agreed upon um, central entity with which to do these things. Uh, I think it's it's just um, not very feasible or, or too difficult uh, to actually accomplish. Uh, but we're going to get into that. I think that's something that we should discuss later um, because we're definitely going to talk about all that once, once we get into these like specific examples. Okay. And also, actually, one, one thing that that kind of reminds me of is, um, <clears throat> you know, let's say, let's say, you know, you're Nikola Tesla or some kind of forward-thinking inventor who can uh-huh. see – who can see a world where people communicate, you know, with wireless devices, right? Or, you know, <laughs> see a mm-hmm. world of, um, you know, let's say Leonardo da Vinci, right? He could see a world <laughs> of flying machines, right? And uh-huh. then, of course, all of his contemporaries say, you know what? No, you're crazy. You're insane. Sure. <clears throat> That's impossible. That's never going to happen, right? Uh-huh. So, so it's not like... Um, he knew exactly what was going to happen, or how that's going to come about, or how all the details were going to were going to mm-hmm. you know be laid out. And some of these visionaries were persecuted uh, in in means that had nothing to do with government, right? Uh, so, like Galileo, he thought that um, the Earth was not the center of the universe, and which completely went against uh, religious beliefs at his t- at his time. And uh, he was actually persecuted by uh, a religious sort of structure, not a government sort of structure, right? Um, and that's kind of like I, I think well, these, well, sort, church and these state sorts was, of like church and state was merged at that time, right? Uh, so church was the government basically. That's what, that's where they got their power. Not not really. I mean, like people lived in areas that where like the 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 Catholic Church had no direct influence. Like the Pope didn't live near them. Or there was no like you know. Um, no, like religious body uh, that controlled the government near them. It was the government was controlled by independent rulers. I mean, they, people just uh, sort of believe that uh, enough people believe that religion was uh, 
you know, that these religious beliefs were correct and that gave them power, but it wasn't like, you know, some bishop or cardinal was in charge of their like state or anything. I mean, you know what I mean? So, so okay, l- let me ask you a question. So what what would you say the difference is um, between a person who pledges their undying faith to the Catholic Church uh, or a person who pledges their undying faith to a monarch or the coat of arms of a monarch or the person who pledges their undying faith into the federal government and the Pledge of Allegiance and the American right, so, flag. So what <laughs> you're saying, what, what you're getting at, right, is like these are all power-based hierarchical structures, right? Influencing other human beings and convincing them that you should follow either like a, you know, government structure or a religious structure. It's based on power and human influence. I mean, my argument is that like that is not what is the problem. The problem is that well, quote unquote problem. I don't think this is actually a problem, but this is just a symptom of the fact that power exists. Power is something that happens in human beings. Like as long as one human being can convince another human being that an idea is true or that they should be followed, then people will follow others. Like look at Alexander the Great, right? He, all he started out was as a, uh, he started out as a prince of Macedonia, not insanely powerful. I mean, Macedonia wasn't like a huge nation or anything, but he didn't have like, you know, he wasn't like a godly figure or anything, right? You could disobey him if you wanted to, but people were inspired by him. People chose to follow him. People went to, I mean, I'm sure if you asked any of those guys individually that in two years, are you going to be in India? I don't think any of them would have said, yeah, I'm going to just choose to go to India for no reason. No, like, they wanted to follow Alexander to the ends of the earth. They would have died for him. And it wasn't like a government structure that forced these guys to go anywhere. They were the army. They could, you know, if the entire army decided, hey, I'm just going to like mutiny and kill this guy, they could have done it, but they didn't. Yeah. These sorts of things kind of happen naturally among human beings. I mean, you can't say like, we're just going to suddenly all get rid of religion. People are not, not everyone's going to agree with you on that. <laughs> but religion's going to continue to exist probably till the ends of time. No, no, that's true. I don't contest that. And, and I don't contest that, that people are always going to seek power and that there's going to be, you know, uh, those mm-hmm. who lust after power. That's completely mm-hmm. understandable. There, are, there is a, I do understand that there's a minority of sociopaths in society who are always going to seek to dominate and control others at the expense of those people, right? Um, the the uh-huh. problem that I have is, when you create an institution that we call government where those t- types of sociopathic people tend to become attracted to in order to focus their, um, <laughs> their power, <laughs> you know, I have a problem with that. And, you know, you know, one sociopath in a padded room, you know, is not a threat to me. But when you put him in a position of power and millions of people believe, really truly believe that this guy has power, then you uh, have a problem. Because well, then you have millions of people that die as a result of him, not only dying for him, but people who die as a result of the wars that he creates like in foreign countries, right? So this uh, is a big problem <laughs> when you give people power. So, uh-huh. so the way but, I look at it, it's not that... It's not that some people are corrupt or that some people um, shouldn't be given power. It's that nobody should be given power. And, and so we should not it's, not... it's not about like the Game of Thrones, right? It's not about who should sit on the Game of Thrones. It's the fact that the throne exists at all. That's the problem. That is the problem. When we don't mm-hmm. give people a conduit to focus and hone their evil, their sociopathy, <laughs> I don't see... I don't see where the big problem is. I see in that kind of society, um, harmony is what I see. Okay. Um, I mean, two, two points of disagreement. So one is that I don't believe that everyone who enters public service is like a, uh, an evil person or a wrongdoer. Like, I feel like there are people that they want their life focus to be helping others, right? And that's what a lot of people that go into politics are. They are actually like just noble so, like public working people they just they they want their livelihood to be spent um creating things and doing things that benefit people other than than themselves and they don't want that life to be focused on profit i mean that that is just the case that there are 
noble people that do this work. Uh, now, there are some people that get into politics for less than benevolent reasons, right? Um, but one benefit of democracy is that uh, if such things are like found out and made public knowledge, um, there are measures in place by which those people can be evicted from office, right? So that is one thing. Um, and the other thing is that um, if we get rid of all these structures, right, if we just say, hey, we're going to start over everywhere on the entire world, uh, we're just going to get rid of government, right? Problem is, like, it's not always given to them, right? Like, nobody said, yo, uh, like, uh, nobody, like, in the current government said, yo, we want Adolf Hitler to take over. No, Adolf Hitler got enough people behind him, convinced enough people that uh, his ideas were correct, and then he just took it by force, right? And so, like, I believe that that would just happen eventually. If you had an anarchistic society where, hey, we're going to just, like, a bunch of us are going to agree that we don't want government, uh, somebody's going to say, you know, there's going to be some external evil to point to, hey, look, uh, Russia's getting too powerful, and we need to band together to stop them, and so I'm your man, I'm your leader, and I'm going to guide us to victory, and it's just going to happen, right? I, I mean, that's just my feeling, is that if you just try to create a society without government, government would, would eventually come back, just because we need ways of managing this territory that we all call the United States, yeah. and uh, government is sort of like uh, the most uh, centrally um, powerful way to do so. Like, if you basically just say by decree, we, we need an army right now to stop this outside force, that's a much better way of doing it than saying, hey, all these like privately in, you know, interested companies with their own like engines and the, they're, they're all their, their own CEOs with their own ideas spontaneously have to decide to essentially fund this defensive force that somehow is not is much more difficult. <laughs> That's my point. Okay. Um, so... Yeah, there's, there's a few things. Um, so, you know, the the way I look at it, right? It's 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 not like, um, you know, there's there's these things that are necessary. You know, there there's certain things that we have come to believe because we all grew up in a society completely dominated by government. Like we can't imagine what a society would look like that had a completely free currency, right? We can't yeah. imagine what a society would look like that had a completely free well, actually, uh, defense agency. We can't actually. Imagine. A lot of times, uh, countries don't have their own currency. Currency, like look back in um, like um, the Middle Ages and stuff, where like a lot of other countries used Roman currency because they had a stable value. And so, like these countries, like you know, like the Roman. Uh, what was the? I forget what the name of it. Uh, Denari. Denarius. Yeah. Den yeah. Den the denarii. Uh -huh. Like that. That wasn't their own currency. Like they didn't. That country didn't have the ability to back that currency because, like, they could just disappear tomorrow if the you know barbarians invaded or whatever. But they all fixed on the Roman currency because Rome was a powerful empire. They weren't going to go away. It had a stable value. Blah blah blah. So um, it wasn't always like a country instituted its own currency back then. Okay. No. Well, well I'm saying. I'm saying now. Like we. Yeah. Growing up now, we can't imagine what a society like that would look like because we're completely immersed in, you know, a government-controlled currency, government-controlled education, mm -hmm. government-controlled, you know, defense, defense department. We can't, we can't imagine what it would look like to have private defense. Like, what mm -hmm. does that mean, right? So, yeah. so we, it's really difficult to imagine. But I, I yeah, think yeah. One, of, one of the errors in reasoning that, uh, that one might commit is, is the, uh, the logical fallacy of ignorance. So if, if I can't imagine it to be so, therefore it cannot be so, right? So I think this, well, is, this, okay, is, a, this is a major problem that, that you know, that completely, um, uh, you know, that completely, I say, you know, uh, renders moot or, you know, um, I say, uh, it, it, it's, yeah. like, it's like it renders impossible the, the idea that something better could be made that we cannot conceive of. Like, like if, if you tried to force somebody, uh, if, you tried uh -huh. to, if you tried to force somebody to create Bitcoin, right, or create the internet or create, you know, I don't know, create a cell phone. If you tried to force somebody to create that, that would not be created. It, things like that do not be, are not created by force, right? They're created by people who innovate and create things, you know, 
as a means for perhaps enriching themselves, right? For profit. All right. And then as, yeah. a, as a result, they enrich society. So we all okay. benefit basically. But like on the other hand, you can't have these very simple things that we have in our everyday lives. And uh, you can't like – there can't be no known way of making that thing work uh, – in order to go with a proposal like i'm not just gonna blindly close my like close my eyes and just trust the fact that like we'll figure it out somehow let's go with <laughs> anarchy we'll be okay like we need to just kind of like have an idea of how that might be handled so that you know we we just like jump off the deep end with a little bit more faith you know what i'm saying well i think again that goes back to the um the abolitionist movement during the uh, the 19th century right the the abolitionists did not know what a society would look or they did not know how a society would function absent slavery right but all right never, that's not never, actually the, nevertheless that no no, no that's not, not actually true though like i mean historically there have been societies that were slaveless and they okay, were well, I'm, okay. I'm talking about major western industrialized countries at that time most of them were slave slave uh producing societies. i mean that's know, actually not 100 percent. i mean yeah but like the north I mean, sure, they benefited from, like, the cheaper cotton from the South, right? But for the most part, the North was more industrialized and had way less slaves. Like, they were making the leap into the industrial age, and the South was behind, right? And that was kind of the whole idealistic argument back and forth was, like, hey, like, the North is like, hey, I don't think we need slaves anymore. We have these factories that sort of accomplish a mass amount of labor with little input, like we can do without the people slaves because we have machine slaves instead. You know what I mean? So that that's what the North ideal was. And the South ideal was, hey, we have plantations. We want to protect them. So I, I mean, I t disagree. I don't think that this is a good example. I think that um, like there can't be an ambiguous answer to the question, how are roads going to work? Or how am I going to get myself to work every day? Like those need to have unambiguous, clear solutions to them, or else we can't really deem your proposal as a actual sound proposal. We have to say, Hey, this doesn't work. So okay. let's get to some of these things. Okay. Okay. Right? okay so, uh, well, yeah. So, so we, we can say, talk about those things, but, but I just want to preface it by saying that I think again, when you, when you're stressing for you know a clear detailed outline of how a stateless society would work you're actually treating the economy as if it's man-made right and the economy is anything but man-made right it's just like just like a jungle right it's 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 formed spontaneously <laughs> between people who are transacting right regardless uh -huh. regardless of the numbers right so something like that not only is it not man-made but any intervention that will that you know some some uh, control freak in a in a government office will will attempt to um you know to 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 construct or enact a law to meddle with it would mm -hmm. inevitably end up um worsening the situation and damaging people along the way uh, see i think that's completely wrong so like the major problem well one of the major problems that i see with anarcho-capitalism is that government creates demand and for things that are not profitable and those some of those things are necessary so for example um public defense so government the way that our society works today government creates artificial demand for weapons that uh are used for self-defense now if this is a completely free market society with no government there i don't think there would either be an unhealthy demand for weapons or not enough demand for weapons to keep our society protected from outside force, right? So governments don't, I mean, I'm sorry, weapons don't really generate profit directly, right? Like, why I'm going to build 50 tanks. How is that generating profit, right? Like, a private company, why would I be building tanks as a private company? If, if my goal is to make money as a company... Why am I going to build tanks? It is for either one of two purposes, right? It's either to use those tanks to generate profit, which means like using them forcibly to take over other companies or something, or I'm just buying tanks for no reason and I'm losing money. And if there's no war to fight, if there's nothing to defend, those tanks are wasted. So like in a supply demand market, there needs to be demand in order to create the supply. And what is the demand for weapons? Like if I'm demanding weapons. What is that for, right? Is it for, as a private company, that's like, it's either a waste of money or I'm going to use the weapons for something. 
So, so and using if, the weapons for something as a private company is like a dangerous idea, right? So you're saying if, if there's no government, then nobody would have any weapons or we wouldn't need weapons or what? What are you saying? <laughs> well, what I actually think would happen is that big, business, big businesses would militarize in order to further their own interests is what I think would happen. Okay. All right. So maybe this is a good segue into talking about a little bit of a stateless society and hypotheticals. So, sure. So, so, so you know, we should we should just say that you know, of course, we don't we have no idea how this would happen <laughs> because there's not really too mm-hmm. much precedent in history to draw yeah. from. Uh, mm-hmm. So this is entirely mostly our speculation. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, using the uh, the knowledge we know up until now, right? So, right. I want to start with easier ones though, because right, I think we. We can get into like the really tough ones later on, but let's start with some of the like the ones that I think you could have a reasonable response to in a relatively short amount of time. So let's start with um, let's start with roads. So like, how do you think that roads would work in a stateless society? What's your proposal for that? Well, I don't think that's uh, actually uh, entirely a complicated thing because we okay. already, we already do have private roads. Um, you know, you look at like mall complexes, you look at plazas, you look at, you know, Disney World, right? All these are private roads, right? And so uh-huh. so the difference, when you look at a private road and you look at a public road, so uh-huh. so there, there's this idea of the uh, the tragedy of the commons. Have, have you heard about this this uh, concept? Uh, well, you can explain it okay. for the purpose All right. of All right, so tragedy of the commons is um, the idea that when something, uh, when, when a resource is publicly owned, as in, you know, it's owned by everyone and it's owned by no one, <laughs> um, then the incentive is not to take care of that resource, but rather to exploit it, right, and to abuse it. Because nobody has a, a personal vested interest in taking care of that resource, right? No, nobody nobody uh, is uh, entrusted to take care of it, right? No one person. Um, so mm-hmm. so as, as opposed to if things were privately owned, you know, you own things yourself, of course, you know, you want to take care of your possessions, right? So, 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 you know, whatever you own, your house, the land you live on, let's say you own a lake, you know, you own a lake, you know, and let's say you want to get fish. So you have a personal vested interest not to overfish in the lake, right? Because you want to make sure there will be future fish, right? So you allow the, the lake to respawn, things like that, the fish to, you know, to reproduce. So, so that you know, this applies to basically anything, right? Anything, most things that are that are publicly owned are most likely mostly trash and abused and just destroyed because nobody really cares about it. Why would you care about a government, you know, road? Like, who cares? <laughs> Not many people care. But when it's their own, when they have their own money on the line, oh, okay, okay, then people care. So, so in this sense, you look at the difference between private roads and public roads, and you can clearly see a difference. In the amount of maintenance, you know, the amount of care, you know, that how neat it looks. Just, I mean, just look at a private road like in Disneyland. It's amazing how you know you don't see potholes there, <laughs> and if you do, they they okay. don't take they don't take months and months to to uh, to fill okay, up so the potholes. Okay, <laughs> so what you're talking about right now, you're talking about roads that are near to a business and sort of affect that business's bottom line, right? Yeah. So like yeah. that that's the important quality of the the private roads that you're speaking of. Yeah. The types of private roads that I'm speaking of are roads that would ne- necessarily go through the indi- like the private land of an individual person, right? So like let's say you as Danilo Cuellar own the private property that goes up Dunderberg Mountain, right? Like geographically, it makes the most sense to build a road along your property because it's the the shortest path to get to something of importance, right? So there necessarily needs to be a road through your property. And let's say you're the type of person that doesn't really want people driving on your property. Like what happens then, right? Like, or let's take an even more severe example. Let's say you own the property that goes through like the Cumberland Gap in, te- in Tennessee, right? And so if you don't drive through the Cumberland Gap, you have to go like 50 miles west or east to get around this mountain. Or you have to build some kind of tunnel. So let's say you just don't want people driving through your private property. Or let's say you know that people have to drive 50 miles out of the way if they don't drive through your, pr- your private property. So you're going to charge $10 a head, $10 a person to drive through your property. And you know they're going to pay it because it's going to cost them 15 bucks in gas to get around you. So what's the solution there? Like what is going to happen okay. if 
yeah, these people owning private property just do not want roads in their private property. Yeah, it's a so, reasonable thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I've heard this argument. You know, some people, you know, say, you know, what if, what if you buy roads all around my house, and then say, if you trespass, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> like, what, what are you yeah, going to do? Well, you know? that's yeah. a whole other thing, right? So, Trespassing. So, so, yeah, I mean, what, this is basically what you're talking about, right? Like, you own a road, and nobody can go on it. So, 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 one thing we have to keep in mind um, in a in a stateless society is that there is no taxes, right? No taxation, and and also no um, no control of the currency, right? So. Um, inflation, as we understand it to be, is is entirely a government um, uh, phenomenon, right? It's only essentially comes about through central banks and currency creation and interest rate rigging, right? So, so in a stateless society, there will necessarily be a more stable currency, and people will be wealthier since they will not be robbed through taxation. Okay, so, um, so it's true. That, I think that's an arguable point. I don't. Th- I don't think you can make the clear argument that people will definitely be wealthier. And by people, I mean all people. Like, I think there will be some people that will get wealthier in your type of society for sure. I don't think that people will be wealthier, though. I think that's a very arguable point. But go ahead. No, no, that's true. That's true. You're right. Um, not all people will be wealthy because not all, maybe everybody has different incentives, right? Some people, you know, are inventors and entrepreneurs. Militarization people- of big business is basically what will cause people to not be wealthy. But keep going. Okay. Okay, well, well, what I'm referring to is minimum wage laws, actually. Um, so, you know, the existence of minimum wage laws uh, significantly destroys employment opportunities for those people with less skills, right? We have right now, you know, in most states, I think minimum wage is like, what, seven fifty or $8, something like that. So, so those people who don't have skills to meet, uh, you know, that limit, let's say they want to work for $5, you know, mm-hmm. they can't because it's against the law. So mm-hmm. either they work off the books and the, you know, the, the employer risks his, his livelihood or they just stay unemployed, you know, mm-hmm. you know, homeless person or they, they get un- unemployment, you know, further, mm-hmm. you know, creating a tax burden on the, on, the, on the people who are actually working and paying taxes. So, mm-hmm. um, so, so those people who want to work, like, like most people, I, I, you know, most people want to work. Let's, so if a person is starving, right, they're making zero dollars an hour. They have no job, right? So obviously mm-hmm. a person like that wants food, okay? And they understand yep. that, you know, of course you can steal food from a, from a store owner, but obviously that's not a uh, sustainable business practice. <laughs> you know, a, mm-hmm. being a thief is not sustainable, right? So mm-hmm. the, best, the best and most long-term uh, way to ensure your own survival is to work to sell your labor right for money right uh-huh. so right. so most people would want to work right so uh, you know making a dollar an hour is better than making zero dollars an hour making two dollars right. an hour is better than zero dollars an hour right so sure. without without government restricting employment opportunities for these lesser skilled people there will necessarily be more people working therefore less unemployed less homeless right um, mm-hmm. and and so and so taking that back to the roads um, you know the fact. One the thing fact I would that- say before we continue, uh, okay. I'll let you get back to what you're saying. But one thing I would say is that um, not everybody, not everybody is constantly aware of every business's business practices, right? Like when I buy a bottle of Tide bleach from the supermarket, I really have no idea how. I mean, I could look it up if I wanted to, right? If if people have done the um, the journalism on it, but. <clears throat> Without inspection, I, I, I mean, I don't really care to know like necessarily what the working conditions are at fr- uh, the people that are making this bottle of Tide bleach. Like, I don't necessarily worry myself that much about the, the business practices of the CEO of, of that company. Or uh, I'm basically like mostly concerned about what, you know, I guess if I was a more casual consumer, I'd care about what the packaging looks like. But I don't really care about that what I really care about is the bottom line price and the components of it, like what ingredients are in this bleach. That's really what I, as a consumer, I'm usually cared about. People buy from like Walmart all the time. And I mean, like if you look into what Walmart, Walmart does, like the, as part of their uh, delabeling process, they actually, uh, they employ slave, well, third parties uh, employ prisoners, right? To like delabel all of their things before they get resold, and uh, they they pay their employees really really badly. I mean, if they could pay them like less than minimum wage, they would, and people would accept these jobs because like employment is kind of in bad state currently in the economy. I mean, what I'm trying to get at is basically 
if businesses have bad business practices, it's not always public knowledge, especially when not all this stuff is like always reported on, right? So Okay. All right, so now okay, so now you're getting into like um you know, like let's say like uh, that 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 reminds me of uh you know, people who talk about, you know, um, overseas sweatshops <clears throat> and how that's mm -hmm. essentially what they consider slave labor, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so... I buy products that say made in China all the time. I yeah. hate to say it, but I do. Okay, okay. So, <clears throat> so the way I look at, um, you know, um, employment in general is people are compensated for the, val for the skills that they have at the moment, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So so let's say a person decides to work in McDonald's, right? For whatever it is, I don't know, $8 an hour, right? So mm -hmm. they are they are voluntarily working in McDonald's. They sign the contract, they show mm -hmm. up to work, nobody's forcing them to go, right? They're voluntarily yep. deciding to work in McDonald's. If they knew that they had better opportunities working somewhere else, they can make more money, I don't think they would continue to work at McDonald's, right? I think they would take that, right? What if, what if always... McDonald's, okay, what if M McDonald's owned lots of machine guns, tanks, airplanes, nuclear weapons, and they came knocking on your, your door and said that you're working for McDonald's, would you work for them? That sounds like a government, actually. <laughs> that doesn't really apply. Uh, that sounds like a militarized <laughs> who, McDonald's. Who would be, who would be, uh, uh, you know, pulling the triggers of these many machine guns? <laughs> so McDonald's has an army all of a sudden now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the the people that McDonald's is paying to hold those machine guns, right? I mean, right, they're right. they're a big, powerful business. Okay, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you, so it seems like it seems like one thing that you um, envision would happen in a stateless society is that you know maybe monopolies, right? Well, one one business would rise up above all, above the others, maybe by by all these guns and tanks and warheads, and and then just that's certainly possible. Else, right? I, I, before uh, that is one thing I want to get to, okay. but before we get to that, I want to get to dispute resolution. So, okay. how do you envision dispute resolution working in your stateless society? Okay. All right. Well, well. Let me correct you right there. It's not going to be my stateless society because well, I'm not, I'm in not the, the ruler. one that you, you're proposing, right? You're proposing a difference <laughs> yeah, to okay. the status quo. Okay, Let's good. go with a system other than democracy. Okay, so, okay. in the system that you're proposing, how do you propose that dispute resolution works? All right. Uh, so, you know, just let people know this is just my opinion. <laughs> this is not, right. you know, uh, I'm, there's no certainty whatsoever, right? It's just just hypothetical opinion. So. Um, so yes, dispute resolution is very is a very fascinating topic because um, you know that's one thing that many people consider to be um, you know necessary, completely necessary for the government to control you know courts, the court system, the legal system, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so and so essentially, the way I see it, right, in a stateless society, without without laws, without regulations um, enforcing uh, or or forcing people to act in a certain way, right? Um, what would reign would be well. In my, what in, I would say is like measures of handling uh, negative behavior that we all kind of agree on. But go ahead. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so, and I think you can see this even now, like. Like when you when you go uh, you know to a doctor, let's say for example, you know most people think you know you, you have to go to a doctor that's licensed, right? It has a state license, you know that's important. You know who would ever go to a doctor, somebody who claims to be you know a medical practitioner who doesn't have a license, right? That's crazy, right? But I don't really think that people essentially care about a license. What I think people mostly care about is reputation. Like you, like you don't when you go to a new place, right? You don't just like most of the time you don't like pick at random between all the doctors. Most of the time, most people would ask maybe their neighbors or their friends, "Do you know anybody who you can recommend that you like?" Right? And so, mm -hmm. to me, what this suggests is that people value um, reputation, credibility, right? Yeah, uh, much much higher than any state. Um, license or permit or certification, right? So, so essentially, uh -huh. what these what these papers do is all, all they basically do is again, just like the minimum wage laws, they um, completely shut out a portion of the population that perhaps just talking about doctors, perhaps they may be maybe better practitioners than uh, licensed doctors, but maybe they don't have the the time or the money. To go to, to go to like nine years of nine years of schooling and get into mm -hmm. massive amounts of debt in order to get that ridic ridiculous piece of paper. Okay. So 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 what you're saying is uh, 
<clears throat> basically dispute resolution could be done in a pri- um, in a anarchist yeah, I society I, I, because I didn't, I didn't even get certain <laughs> res- res- resolvers are going to have generate a good reputation for themselves and basically people are going to agree to use these guys who are fair because the fair guys get a good reputation is that kind of what your argument is okay so so you know, you know. Okay, so any kind of business, right? Businesses can prop up, you know, um, and they do now today, anyway. Um, you know, in various fields, right? You can make people make businesses out of <laughs> anything. You know, like like you know, in Detroit right now, there's <clears throat> you can basically say there's anarchy in Detroit right now, right? The the there's a significant number of people have left Detroit, so the tax base is being completely destroyed. So the police basically do not work or do not, you know, enforce their the laws in Detroit, right? <clears throat> so people, a lot of people are afraid of Detroit. So what has propped up in that absence is this company is called, um, uh, I think it's called a threat management company. And it's basically a private uh, defense agency. And, and so their business is in defense, is in, is in securing people, protecting people, protecting businesses against, you know, looters, against uh, thieves, you know, against anybody, anybody who would be, you know, who would attempt to harm them or their business, right? And, and, that's, yeah. their, and that's their business uh, model, right? And, and, and you so, can afford that if you have money, if you have, you know, let's say you're a middle income or rich person, maybe you can afford the service. What if you're a poor guy that can't afford the service and are being looted or robbed or killed or you know okay so so actually i i would uh i would uh characterize that as a <clears throat> as the appeal to pity okay because because you're basically saying that there's this guy that's destitute and um <clears throat> has no resources right and you know i don't know i don't know what the circumstances is around why he's destitute why he has resources because there is reason there is always, always reason why people are like that right mm-hmm. that's that's what we have to discover right so barring all that, barring no, knowing the reasons, I should feel pity for him due to, due to the, maybe the poor decisions that he made in his life, right? So basically you're saying Maybe I, he made the poor decision to be born crippled or okay. mentally challenged or what have you. Maybe he made those poor choices and uh, he doesn't have a lot of money, right? Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm not saying that there's not going to be handicapped people. There's not going to be people who can't work, people who are disabled. And, and actually in that situation... Um, I, what I do see is even today, even with most of people's income that's taxed away, taxed away enormously and inflated away through, uh, currency creation, even in this situation where we are significantly impoverished, there is many, many charities that people donate to, to help the needy, right? I think, I think that it is in, it is in people's general nature to help one another we we always tend towards charity and helping one another so in this sense you know to force somebody to help somebody like for example you know social security or medicare or medicaid or any kind of forced charity right this Mm -hmm. this basically um you know destroys people's natural inclination to help because people do want to help you know and so i i Uh perfectly understand a society, or perfectly see a society that, um, in the, you know, with those kinds of people who just can't work because of, you know, unfortunate birth, you know, or maybe they had an accident or whatever. Um, uh-huh. I, I don't think they're just going to be left on the side of the road to like to wither away <laughs> and die, you know, because yeah. people are compassionate. That's the way I see people. Sure, and I think that certain certain societal functions are reasonably left to charity. I mean. There, there are the necessities and then there's the nice to haves. So like if I'm a poor guy and my home gets invaded and someone shoots my wife and I don't know who did it, um, I don't want to hope that there is a sufficient charity with which to raise the funds to properly investigate and find out who shot my wife. I don't want to leave that to hope or chance or the generosity of my fellow man. I don't want to leave that those types of drastic situations that demand justice, demand um, response. I don't want to leave that to hoping that someone else is nice enough to help me out. Like I, if, if someone <clears throat> invades my home and kills my wife and is rich, I don't want that guy to be able to hire a bunch of thugs and get away with it. Like I want a system by which, uh, those types of situations are ha- handled and treated equally, no matter 
uh, who, what type of resources I have. Now, I, I know you're going to say it's not, things aren't treated equally in the current society. People are uh, you know, of other races or what have you, and the system doesn't always treat them equally. And to that, I would say, no, we don't have a perfect system, but we don't have perfect people enforcing the system either. So you at least have the theory of a, of a strong system in terms of justice when it comes to these drastic crimes, and you're not depending on exterior you know, ge- um, the generosity or the optimistic, you know, hopes of your fellow man helping you out when you, when there are situations like this. I mean, it's just, I don't think there would be sufficient charity to cover these types of situations. It just would not happen, but, uh, that's just my personal thought. Okay. Okay. So, so, okay. All right. So, so talking about, um, <coughs> um, talking about the, um, uh, dispute resolution agencies, right? Um, so one one concept to understand, which is very good to understand, is is that of uh, restitution versus retribution, right? So our current um, our current legal system focuses on um, retribution or revenge or vengeance. Not on really. The person. It's not like eye for an eye or anything. It's not like somebody well, kills my wife, I can go kill them. That's not. No, exactly no, 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 no. Not that. Not that you do it, but I'm saying that the courts do it. Okay, so so that's kill say some- people. W- I mean, <laughs> unless it's like you know completely severe and and only certain states. But like basically, the way that things work in our current society is that you do horrible things and you do some jail time or you pay some fines. It's not like we're completely getting back the value that you took from society by killing 15 people or something. You know. We're not ever getting that value back. Okay, okay, but I'm saying like, like, um, I mean, it's hard to characterize murder. Let's say, let's say robbery, right? Let's say, uh-huh. <laughs> let's say some guy stole, I don't know, five hundred dollars from you, right? Yeah. And, and you know, let's say, you know, this, this is a stateless society, right? Let's say somebody stole five hundred dollars from you, um, mm-hmm. and and so also another thing that most people would have, since since there would be so much competition, so much, um, you know. Um, uh, you know, the, you know, the wealth again would generally be much higher than we would understand. Well, that, here I, I because- think a lot of your arguments suppose that, which I think is a very debatable point. But I think a lot of your arguments, a lot of your defenses, are supposing people are generally well off. Because, which I, because I'm not of the sure absence of taxation, like that, that's but. that's the only reason. Because of the absence of taxation and inflation, that's the only. Because those two things are government um, created phenomena. <laughs> you know. Um, that's the only. That's the only way that government supports itself, right? Through inflation and taxation, is the only way. So yeah, but I think that the militarization of rich rich individuals plus rich businesses would uh, counteract some of that public wealth. Mm, finish up with the, the the example. So somebody steals five hundred dollars from you. <coughs> so you know you have your um, you know let's say you have your um, your defense agency or your insurance company, and you would like to find this person. And so, and you have a reasonable, a reasonable um, idea that it was Bob, right? And so mm-hmm. you approach Bob and you say, you know, I think you stole, and he's like, no. So then, so then you have the two um, insurance companies or di- or dis- dispute resolution agencies um, coming together, and you know, figuring out like you know, one one of them I- investigates the Bob and finds evidence, and the, you know, they so they go back and forth, right? Mm-hmm. So. So it's in in this kind of scenario, it's always in their best interest, and it's always more efficient in terms of um, you know spending less money to resolve the situation peacefully and nonviolently, right? Because once you resort to violence, once you resort to violence, it is very expensive and it is very <laughs> destructive. Not that expensive to if you kill the guy. <laughs> you just pay the pay your mercenaries a one time fee. Look, let's say I'm twice as rich as you. And let's say my my dispute resolution service is twenty thugs, and your dispute resolution service is ten thugs. I'm just saying, like, there's no need for me to be civil about it. Like, let's say I just want to make sure that you, I mean, you don't win, right? Like, okay. the whole point of a dispute resolution is that you secure some kind of punishment on me. What if I don't want to be punished and I have a lot of money? Like, all right, you know, all right. That, no, good. that's entirely possible. It's true. And and what I'm saying is, in a stateless society, what would reign supreme would be um, credibility and reputation, right? So the only yeah. way we already established before that there's there's um, division of labor, right? There's division of labor, so no one person can really be self-sufficient, right? So we all are interdependent on each other. <coughs> so 
for <laughs> one person for one person not exactly to get, true for one person yeah. to get an army or a small army or a, a group of thugs and try to terrorize other people and kill other people you can imagine that the businesses that are surrounding those th that kind of person would most likely not want to trade with such such a barbaric and evil person right and so and so they don't have a lot of choice what will essentially happen or what do you mean won't have a lot of choice well i mean if if i'm in charge of a business big enough that other people can't afford to really not do business with me like let's say i'm the ceo of the dutch east india company or something well that had government backing but you know let's say i'm just like i'm extremely dominant in your area you know I have control over a lot of the trade that goes in and out of India, let's say. And let's say I decide to rape some Indian woman and then shoot, shoot her husband. Like, nothing's really going to happen to me necessarily because everyone else needs to still do business with me. I mean, there may be some kind of like armed revolt, but as, aside from that, like, if I have iron grip control over a particular market segment, like, I can kind of do what I want. You know what I mean? It happens. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so, so the first thing I would say is does that happen now through the government <laughs> and, and uh so the thing about government is that we have like if people do that in government if they are doing illegal things if that gets found out we have means of evicting those people right like basically the rest of the system is supposed to kind of obey what the people want and uh if it doesn't then we have big problems so you know basically the difference there is that you have a system in place to deal with the people that exploit the system in theory, right? In practice, yeah, do some people get away with this stuff? Sure, it does happen. Uh, do we have, you know, perfect people implementing all these aspects of the government? No. So, you know, I would say that, um, sure, like, s some negative things can happen with people that are given a bunch of power, but um, if you have means with, uh, by which to deal with these people, then that's different. Okay. I, I think this goes back to uh, what we discussed last um, in the last video, which was we just t touched upon. It. I don't think we went into detail. Does the president um, have responsibility for murdering people under his uh, um, administration? Who is responsible? Sure. Let's say okay. So all the people that are murdered in Iraq, right? Uh, in th that's not murder. Hold on, you're, you're talking about people that are that fall in combat. That is not murder. Like so that is, is not so, on our so books. What is it? Murder is the unlawful killing of a you know another member of society. Unlawful, right? So us invading a foreign country is lawful. Not against our laws, <laughs> right? It's not against our okay, laws. Okay, okay. So 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 it seems like you're using legality as a as a yardstick for morality. Yes, and actually, all morals are a function of society, right? So, like, killing other people is only bad because we all agree that killing other people is bad. Like, if we didn't all agree that killing other people was bad, then it wouldn't be a crime, right? So, okay, explain that a little more. Like, basically. <laughs> Morals and laws are both uh, both functions of society. Mm -hmm. So, like because because we all think that killing other people is bad in most circumstances, then we outlaw it. But if we didn't think that killing other, like, let's say f there was some other reality where killing other human beings was fine, right? Like you could just kill someone and people wouldn't generally really care about it. Well, in that case, we probably wouldn't create a law about it, right? So, like. Things are only bad because we think they're bad. Like if I think that killing people in Iraq to defend our freedom and defend our country or whatever, or like if I think that that's not wrong, then there's not going to be a law about it because I don't think it's wrong and a bunch of other people don't think it's wrong. So it shouldn't be illegal. It shouldn't be cons considered murder because most of us don't think that that's wrong. Okay. Um, <clears throat> to which I would say um, the Holocaust was legal. Um, slavery was legal and Jim Crow laws were legal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so to use legality as a yardstick for morality, uh, I think is, uh, is highly erroneous. Well, look, people didn't think that slavery was immoral back, you know, 250 years ago. We, slavery is right. only immoral because a lot of people agree that slavery is immoral. And once that started to happen, then it be started becoming illegal. You know what I mean? 